Hello, welcome everybody. Good evening. My name is Anna Ramich. I'm the Vice President and Chief of Staff at the American Academy. Um, welcome all of you uh, for joining us for this panel session this evening called Governing AI, Who Can, Who Should, and To What End? Um, this event marks the end of our uh, full-day workshop, which was held here today across the hall in the library, um, entitled Models, Abstraction, Scale, Understanding Historical and Societal Impacts of Artificial Intelligence, uh, which was co-organized by the Data Science Institute at Brown University and chaired by our fellow Holly Case, who I would give a particular thanks to. She's our fall Axel Springer Fellow here at the Academy, as well as Professor of European History at Brown University. Holly was the chair of today's workshop, and she put in a lot of work to organize and to bring together a really great group and a very insightful discussion, or at least I think it's insightful because the majority of it went way over my head. <laughs> there was a joke about string theory at one point, and everybody else laughed. Um, but I think this evening, tonight, we'll be bringing it a little bit more down to earth um, for all of us, I hope. Um, I want to thank the guests from Brown University who flew out here to join us, and also some of you who managed to make it from Munich one way or another, which seems harder than crossing the Atlantic this week. Um, Last but not least, I would like to thank uh, Microsoft, and we have Guido Brinkel here on the panel from Microsoft, um, and I would like to thank them for uh, for their support of tonight's um, event and today's workshop here in the house. Um, we have the honor of ho hosting four fantastic speakers and one fantastic moderator, as you can see on stage, um, from a range of backgrounds, which I think will cover um, the, 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 this big topic in a very good way. Uh, first, we have Guido Brinkel here uh, to my immediate left. He's the head of regulatory policy and director of corporate affairs at Microsoft Germany. Next to him is Kirsten Rolf, partner and associate director at Boston Consulting Group and former senior, senior digital policy advisor to German chancellors Angela Merkel and Olaf Scholz. Um, then we have the moderator in the middle there, Ludwig Ziegele, who is the business editor at uh, The Economist and was a longtime U.S. tech editor, if I got that correctly. Not quite. Um, I'm the European business editor. European business editor. Thank you. <laughs> then next to him, we have Regina Greenberger, the cyber ambassador at the Federal Foreign Office. And uh, last but not least, we have Suresh Venkata Subramanian, professor of computer science and data science, uh, deputy director of the Data Science Institute. It's like four lines, bear with me. Deputy director of the Data Science Institute at Brown University and former assistant director for science and justice in the White House Office of Science and Technology policy. Please um, welcome them all to the stage. And uh, just before I hand over the mic to Ludwig, I just wanted to let you know that after their conversation on stage, we will open it up for Q&A to both the physical audience here and the audience in the Zoom. So either at that point, raise your hand or type your question um, in the, in the Q&A box. And now, without further ado, I would like to ask Ludwig to please take it away. Uh, I want to start with a question, and the question is to the audience. Uh, and the, the question is, who is afraid of AI? Who thinks that in a reasonable amount of time, we're all going to get killed or turned into paper clips uh, and whatever? So please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, second question, who thinks that... Within a few years, somebody is going to use one of these LLMs to build kind of a cyber weapon or bioweapon and will wipe out humanity. Wow. And who is, let's say, uh, only afraid of more imminent risks like disinformation or the like, copyright violations? Okay. Good. Yeah. And who, who is not afraid at all? Who is not German? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, you've seen that, and uh, let's uh, uh, let me ask this question. Uh, uh, put this question to the audience as well, uh, Suresh. Let's start with you. So, give us an idea what your mental map of uh, the AI risks are, if if you think there are any. Oh well, that's a lot. Okay, uh, thanks for the question. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. So I'm looking forward to. What fellow panelists have to say, and the audience as well. Uh, I'm glad you're all, you know, uh, only moderately scared, which is great. That's a good place to be. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, the mental map I have in my head of AI risks are, in my mind, a division between things that are here right now, that have been here, that have been here for actually years, that we just 
haven't talked about enough. Things like, you mentioned disinformation. I think about issues of bias, especially in the U.S. context, and I'm going to answer a lot of this in the U.S. context, issues of discrimination, issues of lack of transparency and accountability, and the impact on people um, of using AI systems to make decisions about them, especially people who are already you know, disadvantaged in many ways and are subject to even more um, overwhelming supervision and surveillance by AI systems. So for me, that's the most pressing and most concerning form of risk that I've spent a lot of time worrying about, both in my academic capacity as well as when I was in government. Um, I think there are other, there are broader risks that come from, I think you described, you know, the, the use of, you know, AI systems by unscrupulous actors to develop, you know, um, attacks, you know, threats. I view those as risks, but I don't view them as particularly AI generated. Uh, or, or there are risks that already exist that AI might make a little bit easier but are already risks. I mean, there are already risks of generating bioweapons. I think, you know, AI itself is not going to generate the bioweapon so much as make it e maybe easier to search the space of drugs to find one, but which could be done anyway. You still have to synthesize it. And then there are the, what I'll call the science fiction risks, uh, which are, you know, the ones that you alluded to earlier of the, the paperclip optimizer and the, you know, a, a sentient AI, which I will, you know, I love sci-fi. I read a lot of sci-fi and I think that's where it stays for me. Um, and so that's how I think about them. Thanks, Arush. Um, Regina, uh, uh, w w I mean, it, it, would you would you see kind of the risk landscape in the same way, or do you do you differ in that kind of? Are you are you perhaps an ex risker? <laughs> I well, I would. Um, I think we have to accept all these risks that you mentioned uh, earlier as existing risks. I mean, this is not something that Arush uh, made up, but. They, they are there. I'm looking uh, at this uh, through, of course, through the lens of foreign and security policy. And I would like to add um, to what you said, uh, let's say collective risks of uh, a changed geopolitical environment. There are countries that will be able to come up with AI applications that are very powerful and change uh, the power relationship also between countries. And there are others, have-nots, who are completely, uh, you know, exposed to these kind of risks um, imposed on them by, by, by threat actors, both state threat actors, but also uh, non-state threat actors. So I think AI will also change the geopolitical landscape. It changes also, and this is, would be my second point, the ability of, you know, foreign ministries like my own to deal with... Um, challenges if uh, we are not able to really understand what is this about. So I think uh, it also puts us in a situation where we have to step up our efforts to adapt new methods of diplomacy in order to be able to manage and mitigate these risks among countries. So um, at, at the foreign office here, here in Berlin, I mean, how how worried are you about kind of people actually coming, building these cyber weapons. Um, I mean, do you do scenario planning for that kind of, uh, again, how, how worried are you about this, this, these things? Well, there is a, a part of the Foreign Office uh, in the Disarmament and Arms Control Department who are actually looking at what we call killer robots, for example, or other lethal autonomous weapon systems. They are marketable already. So uh, they are there already, and we have to find ways to restrict the use and adapt it to international law. So it's not scenario planning, but it's actually trying to negotiate frameworks that help us uh, rein these new technologies in so that the future warfare is still uh, respectful with regard to international humanitarian law. It sounds a little bit, you know... Uh, uh, cynical, or cynicist perhaps, but uh, actually that is what we do with all weapon systems. Okay, thank, thank you. Kirsten, I mean, you've, you've worked at the Chancellery, so, so, so you're, you're a wonk in some ways, but I mean, now you work for BCG, so you look at this from a business perspective. I mean, what, what do you, what uh, do businesses worry when they think about uh, AI? Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, 
as a Wonk, I of course agree <laughs> with everything that Suresh and Regina have said. And I think those uh, risks are very real. But if I can add something from um, basically on the ground right now and working with the technology every day uh, with large clients, and um, I think I've seen about 200 of them by now in the last six months that I'm um, that I'm working um, with our clients on this on this technology, I would add uh, I think two buckets to the uh, mental map and also two layers that I see risks in. And the two buckets are uh, there's technology inherent risks, and some of them have always been there with AI, and others are new risks that coming from generative AI, and also demand uh, of us a new risk taxonomy. And those technology inherent risks are of course hallucinations, um, actually omittances even worse, right? The technology leaving stuff out or making stuff up, essentially lying. Um, that has become much, much, much better in recent months, uh, but it's also become much more sophisticated, actually, in the technology. Then something that we call capability overhang, um, capabilities of the technology that we actually don't really know uh, that that will happen. So there's no control mechanism in place. Um, I find that really interesting. Deep fakes, a lot of our clients worry about that, especially in the financial institution sector. You can open a bank account, you're not even a real person. Cybersecurity risks, of course. What if someone in that code installs backdoors? So all of these um, technology inherent risks, really some of them are, are brand new and we need to find mitigation mechanisms for them. And then there's, of course, um, the other type of risk, which is regulatory uh, watch out areas. Um, most of our clients really want guardrails for the technology. Um, but I think it's also fair to say that we are the last generation that has grown up in a world without AI. So most of the laws that we've made are for a world without AI. Um, and we need to make sure that we can actually govern in a world with AI and especially with generative AI and where everybody can use it. And that's not so easy. Um, and all of the new frameworks that will come will take a while to become effective. And some of the old frameworks, copyright, IP, data privacy, don't quite work in this world. And that is a real risk for businesses. It's also a real risk for societies. And there's two layers um, that these risks always occur, and these two layers really belong together. And that is the very operational layer of the actual technology, the application layer. So um, people watching these models and watching the, how the models behave and stuff like bias, but also data risk, data bias, etc. cetera, um, accuracy, I mean, to use a model like that in the financial industry, you need 100% accuracy. You can't deal with 98%. It just doesn't work. Same with healthcare, etc. So that's a new risk on the application and infrastructure layer. The infrastructure that you need, chips, etc., is different. And then there's the... Um, the operational layer, sort of the, the organizational layer, who uses this? What do you put in place in terms of um, prompt uh, filtering, in terms of output filtering? Uh, what is What about red teaming? Who does what? Um, and who actually has these controls on an organizational level and on a technical level? So these two layers and the two buckets of risk really make quite a complex operation of implementing generative AI, but we have to manage it because the technology is there. And I think that one of the biggest risks that's often left out in these discussions is the risk of not using AI. Because if you don't use AI, that's also, first of all, an ethical question, having lived through a pandemic in a government and... I often wonder now how many more people could we have saved? How much more fair could we have designed the, you know, the the money that we gave out, et cetera, with just better better analytics possibilities. Um, but also um, not dealing with these with the technology means someone else will. And they will figure out how to create a model that attacks you or um, create the best deep fake um, and you won't even catch it. So I think it's really important to deal with all of these risks. And I I really um, enjoy working um, with the people at the front lines right now and finding out every day something new about these technologies and risks that we didn't know about. Thank you, Guido. Guido. Uh, uh, how, how does how does Microsoft, how does Brad Smith think about risks when it comes to AI? <laughs> I mean, Brad Smith is publicly speaking about this. Um, and um, I, I would start with the point that actually the, the, the reason why we are not discussing this in an abstract policy environment, but also discussing with customers and partners is because in 
also German customers, it's 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 important to emphasize this, have already started to use AI. And by the way, not only uh, generative AI. I mean, AI is not something completely new. It didn't start on November 30, 2022 with ChatGPT. There was AI before. And I think that's an important uh, starting point. So, um, because exactly what you say, the risk not to use it is apparently the, the risk that companies don't want to want to take. So the discussion that we have as customers on the risks, and that's an important discussion, is starting from that point that every company or almost every company wants to use it despite risks and despite the mental mapping that we are now doing here. So starting from that point, I think that um, with AI, um, you have a, a basic truth, and that is basically uh, very much what Brad will, will tell you that you have with many technologies, which is the tools and weapons logic, you know, like the, the dual use or multi-use logic that you're in, you know, that's just, you have a technology can be used in different ways and you have to be aware of the risks. You cannot turn a blind eye on it because that would be, um, that would, would be irresponsible. So, and that's why we're trying to address risks in a, in a systematic way. Um, and we try to implement safeguards already actually before regulation hits. We'll discuss this later. And I mean, there has been a lot of mapping here and it's 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 difficult to add more wisdom to it, but just like maybe getting one step back. First, I think there are obvious risks in certain vertical areas that we currently, because everyone is focusing on generative AI so much, a bit forget about. Like, I mean, before ChatGPT was released, actually, everyone was discussing autonomous driving and the risks involved there because they are so apparent and that's still something to address it's a very specific area but the risks are very clear and but you can also address it in a in a relatively specific way or let's take the health sector similar things there so that is let's not forget this there are like there are these type of more specific risks and then um, I'm very much um, in line with what Suresh has said, is that I think that there are some f types of risks that are somehow accelerated by, uh, by AI, like the cybersecurity discussions. That's not completely new. You know, the, the, the risks uh, have not just emerged from that, but um, there could be more potential to su such attacks, or it could be a bit more of, a, of, a, of mass market tools that could emerge from that, and that is something that we need to keep in mind very, very much. And then, in a far more abstract layer, and that is a discussion that you see in the, on the on high level politics very much, and then also in a philosophical space, is of course the underlying question um, on a very horizontal level: How can you ensure that humans stay in control about the technology? I think that's the underlying question that connects all these dot and dots and matrix logics that we are discussing, and that is the that that is that is. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a challenge, but it's something that you have to discuss from the beginning, how you design the systems in a way that humans stay in control. And um, yeah, that, that would be the mental mapping adding to what has been said before. Yeah. So, so, so lots of maps and, and lots of risks. Uh, Suresh, um, uh, what I found interesting is how kind of the focus on kind of what kind of risk the public debate has focused on has switched or changed. Kind of when I first started writing about LLMs in 22. Um, before ChatGPT, uh, it was it was much more about the immediate risk, about disinformation, about uh, copyright, and all that. And that debate then completely switched early early this year to existential risks, to an extent where kind of it really felt a bit like science fiction. And now, uh, uh, in in the past few weeks or months, uh, it it has kind of the pendulum has swung back again. And I wonder how how, how do you agree with that, and how do you explain that? Is that um, is there somewhat of a power play going on uh, or uh, um, competing interests uh, that certain groups have an interest in focusing on certain risks? How, how, again, what, what, what is your map there? So this is a very sort of personalized bias, but that's what you have a panel for, right? So I'll, I'll give you that. So ChatGPT changed a lot of things. It, it, I think it, it allowed the public at large you know, to see what people in the research community had been seeing but see it very viscerally, viscerally and very close up. You know, you have an interface and you can go on a website and type in a response to get something back. It makes a huge difference. And so in the US, one term for this, it's a cliche, but it's like, you know, tech policy was never a kitchen table issue. Chat GPT made it a kitchen table issue. And therefore everyone, right, from, you know, Congress folks to the White House, everyone's like, you know, have their little, oh shit moment, we gotta do something about this. 
And so that's what happened. And, and, and in many ways, I'm kind of grateful for that. I think, you know, a lot of us who've been working in the trenches around AI concerns were feeling like the traction was slow. There was some willingness, a lot of grudging willingness to think about this, but no sense of urgency. And then this came along and everyone's like, okay, we need to do something now. So in that respect, I think it was a good thing that this explosion of interest happened. What also happened, as you mentioned, is that the, all the ex-riskers came out of the woodwork. Um, they had been thinking about this for a long time, but there was never sort of a proof of concept. And I think chat GPT and the fact that it could interact in a way that seemed you know, plausibly real and human essentially gave a lot of the broader philosophical questions about, you know, are we building sentient AI, sort of a proof of concept, which, you know, allowed that discussion to start playing a role. And I think, you know, I think the only better thing than optimism is panic and fear to get people roused. And I think there was a lot of fear and panic that was uh, fueled by the, by the X-Risk movement. Um, for various reasons. I think there was, that we could unpack a lot of the other political and economic dynamics around this, but that's what it was. And I think that's where the urgency came from, and that's where the desire to do something came from. But I think at least, you know, I'm grateful, at least in the U.S., while there has been a lot of panic, the concrete policy guidance that has come out so far, whether it's from the White House or whether proposals from Congress, has still been a lot more balanced. It's, it's more recognizing all the different issues, uh, recognizing all the issues that all of you have mentioned and putting them in perspective, right? So that there is a, you know, a balance of concerns and, and policy guidance around these issues. So that, I think that's where my read is. I think, you know, what happened with the safety summit in the UK was a little bit different. That sort of sh indicated a little bit more of an influence of the sort of the AI sentience panic. Um, I know some of that is played out in Europe as well, especially with what may or may not happen tomorrow. <laughs> we will see. Um, but it's, it's, there's a very interesting collection of points of view. And I think, you know, often in the press, the, the goal is to resolve things into this or that. But I feel this is a bit more multidimensional. There are, you know, for example, there are the folks who are thinking about the doomers, thinking about X risk, who are in agreement with, you know, people like me who are concerned about, you know, current risks in the sense that we would like to have some regulatory structures. Then there are the folks who are concerned about discussions around open source and other things that we'll probably get into, who are um, in agreement, again, with, I think, folks like me who think, you know, we sh that a lot of people think we should have a bit more robust open source access because that's an important way to learn more about the systems we're building. But which the exoskers think, no, 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 we should not have any kind of open because of the risk. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of different points of view that are circulating with you know different alliances being made and shifted around, which is kind of makes things hard to understand sometimes. So a long answer. But Kirsten, do, do you agree that that the debate uh, and the policy making so far is is balanced, or is there anything you think should you're missing in in that uh, in that debate? In the policy making debate. No, that's a the public debate. Let's see. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's I often think when I, I mean, I travel a lot between the US and here in Asia, um, and I, I often think that we are talking um, not about, like you also, not about the same things. So when we talk about guardrails, for instance, in the US, we often talk about national, the national security approach there, and it's about existential risks and big societal risks and the huge risks of maybe getting backdoors and code, etc. So it's very national security focus. Over here, it's always consumer protection law. And essentially, the AI Act is a consumer protection law. And, and it's very much focused on that. And when I go to Asia, it's very much about, how can I say, um, protection of certain ideologies um, uh, and um, power systems, <laughs> quite frankly, which uh, not to say that that isn't the, the case in other parts of the world, but it's certainly not as much in the forefront. And we often use the same words for, this, for, for completely different issues. So trustworthy AI is something that everyone uses, the doomers, uh, the, the, the enthusiasts, the people that want more ideological um, guardrails in Asia, the, the people here in Europe. It's what everyone uses, but it's not the same thing for everyone. And I think that that's something that confuses the public debate a lot because the promise of trustworthy AI is also not, it's not 
a stable promise, right? I mean, this is a probabilistical technology um, and it will never, it will always be shifting and it moves a lot. So I think uh, in the policy discourse there is a little bit misleading because we use the same language for completely different things. Um, and also, I mean, you must know in international uh, negotiations, that's often a problem, but it's also a big problem uh, when we talk about guardrails and what, what's appropriate and what's not. Okay, now let's let's move on. What uh, it seems to me, we can all agree there are risks. I mean, the emphasis is a bit different. So, uh, if the risk, risks, do we need regulation? Do we need to mitigate the, these risks? And Gudo, uh, the interesting thing with, with this technology is that for the first time, uh, uh, the, the big providers, uh, AI providers, are actually in favor of uh, some kind of regulation. And I would uh, ask, would like to ask you. Why that is? Why all of a sudden does an industry which has always kind of refused to be regulated or uh, not refused but uh, pushed back against regulation is, is, is in favor of regulation here? What, what, what are the mechanisms here? What, what are the economics of that decision? Um, first of all, I think it's not the first time. Um, there are very specific examples where you have seen um, the, in, the tech sector and other sectors actually calling for regulation. Cybersecurity is a, is a good example for this. There's a lot of cybersecurity regulation and the tech sector basically has always been in, in favor of this. I mean, not, not in every detail, but so I, I think that is not actually something completely new with AI. That is, a, that is something that you see for a longer time. And I think it is a bit of a of a misunderstanding of how um, of the how the tech sector and maybe also the complete industrial sector is is thinking about regulation. I mean, when you look at competition regulation, there's something that everyone is in favor because it's necessary, you know, like to have a playing field. So just challenge a bit that assumption. But yes, um, I think there were clear signals from the tech sector that regulation is necessary. And that is uh, very much in line with what I just said before, because regulation is not just the bureaucratic monster that is that is imposed on you and that that you have to deal with that might be the effect of certain provisions but in general good regulation is has several effects that are very 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 interesting for companies and the most important ones are harmonization and standardization um, and that is that is very very important in that discussion um, on on AI because we're relatively early on um, in the technology and we have a regulatory discussion on a global scale that is a bit something new I'd say I haven't seen in other fields as early on discussions on that global scale about the right approach and also including the question can you somehow agree on some baseline rules that would be globally effective and 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 introducing a standardization layer so that is actually something um, that is obviously uh, benefiting anyone in the in the ecosystem and then obviously yeah we need to we need to address certain risks and we need to do it in a, a via regulation because that puts everyone on the same in the same system you know and that is necessary and i mean cybersecurity is a very good example on this but there are also more specific things let's say Watermarking. We are in favor of watermarking. It depends on how you implement it, uh, but this is something where regulation can help because if it's it's an area where you need standardization. I mean, we're in an alliance with Adobe and the BBC on how you could do watermarking on certain types of content, but to be effective, you need to implement it about along the whole value chain actually, and that is something that is definitely easier if you have certain certain common standards and stuff like that. So I think there are very obvious reasons actually for the interest to, uh, industry to be in favor of regulation. But and it doesn't mean, last word, that we like every single proposal out there. Because, that is, I mean, uh, <laughs> and maybe the last point from my side at this point, I mean, what you see and, and the discussion that we're now seeing in Brussels, one thing that, that the legislators are always faced with and which is very visible here is you have an action bias, of course, and then you have uncertainty. And that is a very difficult situation for a legislator. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me kind of specify this qu question and focus on, on, on the so-called frontier, the cutting edge, edge models. What I still think is interesting that, that this whole group of, of, of players kind of pushed uh, uh, people in, in the White House into kind of doing something about uh, frontier models and same, same thing in Britain. And the theory I've heard is basically that uh, these companies were afraid to get into some kind of a race 
a situation where they they would do things that uh, that lead lead to some not catastrophe but some something goes seriously wrong, which would then uh, trigger uh, 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 more annoying uh, regulation. What 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 is your Well, if that would have been the intention, you could now start to ask whether this has worked, this technical yeah. approach or not. But I think the main point here is um, making making policymakers and the public aware that there is more than that, that than what we are just seeing, and 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 that we need to have a discussion early on 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 the whole potential that can expand over time. At the same time. As I said, it is difficult to actually regulate something that is so uncertain. So I think the the question now with AI Act and all the regulatory approaches worldwide is how can you um, satisfy the action bias, the political one that the, there's an ex expectation also from the public, while at the same time creating frameworks that are flexible enough to adjust to changing conditions. Because that's the, the only thing that is sure is that we're gonna see rapid development, you know, and that. That is a that is a challenge. Um, I think that the, indeed that's a space where the U.S. is a bit more like um, experienced in in introducing frameworks in, in combined with technical standardization that are by definition flexible. Um, but yeah, that's that's the challenge. Okay, uh, Vegina, what, what, what's your thinking on regulation? Do we need it? What should we focus on? Yes. Well, let me first comment on <laughs> no, no. some things that have been said. So uh, Guido's point about standardization, I would absolutely subscribe to it, but this is something that private sector has to lead. So um, if, uh, you know, at the ITU, which is a very important standardization body of the United Nations in the digital field, um, Chinese delegations show up with 100 people with a hundred experts and there is nobody from Europe and 10 people from the US. This is not uh, a balanced situation where the standards that come out of this discussion will serve uh, the purpose of uh, European or American uh, companies. So I think there we, what we actually need is also this kind of mindset where we see, okay, we have to invest also from private sector side into this level play, playing field that you are, you're asking for. And uh, Kirsten said, European legislation or regulation is about consumer protection. I would put it a little bit wider. It's, it's a risk-based and human-centric uh, approach. So it's not only the, the rights of a consumer vis-a-vis -vis a product, but it's also made in order to protect a European way of life with all the components like good governance, rule of law, human rights, civil rights, and so on. So the mindset of the European uh, regulation is really to protect uh, the European uh, way of life. And um, therefore, it, it, it is, I think it is important, we were discussing this uh, before, before this panel, that, um, that, it, the, that there is an agreement uh, within this legislative term, because otherwise... Europe will be very late in coming up with uh, a regulation that can be leveraged by the purchasing power of the internal market. So now your question. Um, I would start even earlier. I think we, what we actually also need, in addition to regulation, which could be based on a national or, um, or a regional jurisdiction, is uh, governance. So what... What what I'm uh, advocating for is global governance uh, mechanisms that bring all governments on board somehow, but also the other stakeholders in, in the technology, like private sector, academia, civil society. Because the problem that we create with AI is not solvable by regulation alone. We have to... to um, Uh, share or to develop a shared and aligned mindset about how we can use this technology for the common good. And this can be strengthened and enforced by a global governance mechanism that, for example, shine a light on the question how AI can help us achieve sustainable development goals. Health, uh, I mean, you mentioned the pandemics. So global health um, risks that we have to deal with as a, you know, as a planet, not only as Germany or Europe. Now, 
Uh, before we talk about global governments, let's talk a little bit more about uh, kind of approaches to regulation. And you've described very well what the European approach is. And I wonder if, uh, if Suresh, if you could talk about how you're thinking at the White House was, because it seems to me it's, a, it's quite a different approach you, you, you took with the EO. It, it is different. Um, and I, by the way, I should say, I mean, I was there when we did the blueprint. I, I was not involved myself with the EO, but the EO does draw on that. So on the, the executive order. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the executive yeah. order. I was not involved yeah. with that, so I just want to clarify that. Yeah. I mean, the US definitely takes a very different view. I, mean, I think, you know, it's, it's sort of... The U.S. has a much more what I'll call a vertical view of these things, namely that individual sectors have individual regulatory frameworks. They have regulatory bodies. They have laws around them. You know, the way the financial sector gets regulated is very different to the way healthcare gets regulated, which is very different to the way employment and hiring gets regulated. And that's just how the U.S. functions. And so by nature, the, the governance of AI systems and the regulation of AI systems also falls in that way. If you look at, for example, the executive order, it has... It has it has some basic principles, it has guidelines, but the main thing in the executive order is, hey, all government agencies, it's now your job to go figure out what is needed in your sector based on these overall principles that we're outlining here. And that's kind of, you know, to, to the extent that you want to compare and contrast it to the European horizontal view, which is this broad, you know, overall overarching sort of theme, I think that's one sort of philosophical, I wouldn't say difference, but just a different way of approaching it. I think you end up ideally in the same place, but through different implementation mechanisms. So that's what I would say. And I think, you know, again, in the U.S., of course, there's a much more, I would say, if not deference, but sort of a, an understanding of what business needs are and an encouragement of businesses to take up sort of some of these roles. And the way I've, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, we can't just do regulation. We need all these other components. I think you're absolutely right that we need all the stakeholders involved. And at least in my own mind, the way I've thought about it and talked to others about it is that, you know, you need regulations in the short term, but in the medium term, what you also need are market incentives to sort of encourage this, right? So what you want to do is create a market incentive for responsible AI practices to be profitable, to be something that companies are, uh, they find it's worth their while to do, that they can sell, that they can market as a value add, as a competitive advantage. And then the long run, what you're going to then see is that you're going to have a culture change where the norms around what you expect your software systems to be able to do just changes. And that's much more of a long term. So I see all these things working in tandem. And you, you can't change culture in the short term. You can't suddenly create markets from nowhere. But you can start with the regulatory environment that then creates it. And I think that that idea, that theory of change that involves all of these players is, I think, part of how the U.S. thinks about it, which is why, you know, when the Department of Commerce gets involved and when... <coughs> when the regulatory agencies get involved, but then you also talk about staffing and research and funding for education at universities. You, you, people are seeing all of these things happen at the same time. And that's, that's one way of talking about so this this vertical versus horizontal approach, uh, I was wondering, and, and you said in the end we, we're going to end up or we want to end up in the same place. I just wonder to, to, to what extent is that, that possible? Like kind of how compatible is the AI Act with... Uh, uh, with uh, the executive order, in, in particular with regards to what you said about international governance. I mean, does, does that create conflicts down the road? I mean, I think there are many elements that are very similar between uh, elements in the AI Act and in, in the, the, sort of the guidelines or the draft guidelines that have come out for agencies. Right? Uh, I think when it comes to you know, frontier models and foundation models, we're going to start, you know, we'll have to see what happens and there might be some differences. But for the most part, I think there is broad agreements on the kinds of governance, the kinds of transparency, the kinds of concerns that have to be dealt with. So I'm not... There will be a harmonization process. There's the Trade and Technology Council between the EU and the US. There's the, you know, the G7 sort of declarations and other mechanisms to harmonize some of these things, which will have to happen. But of course, you have to have something concrete in place first. And so we don't yet have any of those things. I mean, even the executive order is still just an executive order. Ideally, we'd have a bit more than that. We'd have you know, regulatory guidelines. We'd have Congress acting. We'd have states acting. So I think there's definitely, I don't think there's anything in principle saying that cannot be harmonized. But the details matter, like with all these things. So. Details matter, Kirsten. Um, uh, let me be a bit contrarian here. So, uh, I mean, we're, it seems to me we're trying to regulate something which we think is important, where we think there are risks, but it's not something we understand particularly well. We do not really know uh, uh, what these frontier models can do, what emergent capabilities may, may come out of them. So, still, we're trying to develop very detailed rules and, and, and the executive order is, is uh, not required reading. I would say it's too long. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was, 
and, and, and the AI act certainly is. Uh, but it's, it's, it seems to me that, so we're building these rule books, even though the technology is changing uh, basically by the day or by the, by the hour. Uh, so, and, and, and I mean, the AI act itself is an example. I mean, when it was first introduced, in, I think in early 2021, uh, there was nothing on uh, large language models in there. But now that's all we're talking about. So how can we write rules for something we cannot, uh, we do not understand, which is qu quickly changing? Uh, wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better for Europe to wait a bit? And perhaps uh, if, if tomorrow there is no decision on the AI Act and uh, they can't agree on something, that's actually a blessing in disguise. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I think, you know, uh, I mean, that's the nature of tech regulation. Actually, that's almost the nature of all sci science regulation, that it never is as fast as the development and innovation. It's always been like that, actually. Um, and I actually think the European AI Act shows that Europe in particular has learned quite a bit um, from also recent uh, and, and other developments in, in regulating these things. Um, and I think, I mean, the one thing that I'm afraid of is not so much that we come up with regulation or not. The thing that I'm afraid of is that we create regulation where we bite off more than we can chew and where there's no follow through. Because if there's no follow through, then really government and regulation lose its, lose its teeth and once that's the case, then really we've lost the power to regulate and, and uh, rule uh, over this technology and over the, the companies that, that built it. Um, so I think even if the AI Act is not perfect, it's not about the actual document. It's about the spirit of the, of the law much more. And implementation will then also um, be much more detailed. Standardization will happen uh, in a follow through. Um, there will be a, like more detailed um, national governance, et cetera. But it certainly is. I agree. It would be very, very late if it doesn't come in this legislative turn. Um, and it's, it's not like the letter of the law matters as much here as the spirit of the law. And as also just showing um, that we're d discussing this and that this is something um, where we really want to um, also have a say as Europe. Um, and the other reason and the other point that I wanted to make is that... Um, I do think governance matters and I do think international governance matters for sure, but it takes a long time and um, I've yet to meet the person in industry that says, I really want to build a totally discriminating, really evil algorithm, please. Um, can you do that? No, nobody that I've met wants that, um, but what everybody is looking for is benchmarks. So what does it mean to protect European values? Like FAIR, for instance, means something different in HR than it means in marketing transformation, than it means in building a car, and that it means in healthcare and in banking. So the, the thing that I'm a little bit worried about with the AI Act is not so much um, that it's too soon and not catching up with the technology, but that it's too... Mm, that, that that the horizontal approach is uh, maybe a catch-all and that the, in the effect doesn't catch anything. Um, because where I see the um, technology mostly used right now is for getting rid of tasks that um, are really not particularly pleasant, is efficiency uh, mostly. Um, and it, it means something very different to protect European values in the, in the different applications of that. Um, and I think it's a good framework and we'll see how it develops in, in, in the coming years. I think it's a good start, but with all European legislation, we've seen how it developed then also in the national flavors, but also in the international discussion. But with nothing there, I think we're also not catching anything. Mm. And, and, and should, should they agree on, on, uh, on a deal tomorrow or in time, kind of before the elections next year, do you expect expect there to be uh, a uh, Brussels effect similar to the one after GDPR, GDPR or are we past that? Is, 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 can, can, we, can we expect Europe to set the rules if, if, if it can agree to, to come up with rules? I think that, I mean... I think that very much also depends a little bit on what that deal looks like. Is it a political deal where all of the details will need to be worked out afterwards, like we've had before with the US-EU data transfer um, agreement? Is it 
something that leaves too much uh, up for discussion? Um, is there no deal? I mean, there's just so many possibilities. Uh, but I do think whatever happens, this whole process of the EU AI Act has certainly made Europe's position very clear in the world. And if we have a deal or not tomorrow, Europe still has de debated, has taken two years of debate to come up with, uh, with a position, even though we, maybe we don't agree on the details tomorrow, but we have at least agree agreed on the fact that we want European values to matter in the world of AI, and that's also something. Mm. Uh, 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 Go ahead. I was wondering, you know, since it's a panel and we should make it spicy, like, okay. yeah. <laughs> if I could complain about the moderator for a second. Okay, so, complain. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so the, the question you asked, I think I wanted to question the premise of your question itself. Right? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so you asked, right, you know, should we be regulating systems we don't know anything about? I think you have to be very careful what you're talking about here in terms of systems we don't know anything about. There are systems we are talking about which are frontier models, which are like this much of applications that we know nothing about. There are these all AI systems that we're deploying everywhere that we know a ton about. And we have no reason to stop trying to put in regulations, which is what most of the AI Act sort of talks about and what most of the executive order talks about. So I think it's important to be careful which kind of AI systems we're talking about because there is a lot of confusion around foundation models, you know, decision-making systems, predictive systems, and so on. And I find it's, it's helpful to be very clear about which system we're talking about. And the second thing I'll say, you know, a bit of, you know, US boosting here since we're talking about the AI Act, <laughs> is that personally and I feel like, you know, the EU kind of tied itself in knots a little bit with definitions around AI. And, a lot of, and especially when ChatGPT came out, got into a lot of trouble trying to figure out how to scope this. One way in which the executive order and the blueprint kind of sidestepped this issue was to talk about impact and not talk about technology. So if you look at the OMB guidance, the Office of Management and Budget guidance that goes along with the executive order that says this is what we ask agencies to do, what they say is, there are two kinds of impacting technologies, technologies that have, are, have safety impacts, you know, on infrastructure and on um, critical, you know, electricity grid and the nuclear power plants and so on. And there are rights impacting technologies that affect, you know, housing and education and finance and, and healthcare and all these things. If your system is in one of these categories, they don't say this, but I like to say this, I don't care if it's an Excel spreadsheet or not, if it's rights impacting, you have to do all these things which is a way of, I think, within the U.S. context of sidestepping some of the both rapid development as well as some of the confusion around, is it a generative AI system? Is it a predictive AI system? Is it something else altogether? The point is, it does not care. If your rights are being impacted, then this is what you have to do. And I think that actually was a useful device and is hopefully going to be a useful device to be kind of future-proof as the technology evolves. And I'm interested to see how this plays out in the European context. Thank you for the complaint. Um, um, and I agree with you. And uh, uh, Regine, uh, I mean, w w what's your prediction um, uh, on, on the AI Act? Uh, um, I mean, the, it seems to me that, it's, it's in particular, Germany changed its position here a bit, at least that, that what emerged from certain non-papers which were circulated, that before um, uh, uh, regulating foundation models was not a problem uh, now all of a sudden it is. Well, let's say um, we haven't talked about the innovation part of the regulation yet. And the non-paper that you're mentioning is focusing especially on that. So let's uh, have a regulation that doesn't stifle innovation. And generative AI is at the moment the area where, you know, progress is the, you know, there is most progress in this field at the moment. I'm still optimist that we work out this AI Act, also because, as Kirsten said, there is a strong spirit that we need this and that Europe wants to be a rule maker in this area and not um, a rule taker if we come uh, too late because this technology is so transformative and disruptive that we really have to do it. oh shit moment also in Europe we have to do something about it if we want to continue to live like we live today um, in contrast to the executive order this will be an act so it will be immediate law it, uh, it has uh, no expiration date <laughs> so it's not linked to a particular administration and it will come with the necessary implementation mechanisms including 
uh, institutions and budgets. And I think that makes it, um, uh, or this, this creates uh, better preconditions for really being effective than um, in the end. So I would say I'm, I'm an optimist and I think the moment is is ripe for uh, European legislation. By the way, we are often um, framing this as the first, you know, re AI regulation. Actually, it isn't. China came up with a regulation just some months ago. And this also uh, highlights the pressure that is actually uh, on the international debate uh, at that moment, at this particular moment. And I think um, the urgency that... Um, was uh, part of the AI safety summit in Bletchley Park is part is partic is uh, partly influenced by this sense uh, by this um, um, perception of that other big actors global actors are moving fast forward at the moment, which is a great segue to. Um AI governance, global governance, and uh, question to you uh, uh, again is: is kind of can you outline to us what you see emerging there? Kind of what is the what is what is kind of or can you already tell that there is kind of, uh, what kind of type of mm -hmm. uh, regime we will get uh, for that for that question? Okay, um, I have perhaps to describe a broader framework if you if you bear with me for a minute. So. Um, the framework or the context where I see best chances that we get really all or a majority of, you know, of countries and people on board is the United Nations. Um, this is not, uh, you know, not the most efficient uh, environment for uh, for governance, uh, as we all know, but it's the only place where um, at least the global South countries have faith in that it will come up with um, with a solution that will also serve their purposes or their objectives. So, United Nations Secretary General put up a common agenda. Within this common agenda, he describes. Uh, his way forward in his second term and he wants to um, come up with a summit for the future in the end of 2024 which should uh, uh, you know step up efforts to reach the sustainable development goals until 2030 and we are way behind uh, the implementation of these goals so within um, the, uh, the summit for the future there is one particular building block that is relevant here this is the global digital compact and within the Global Digital Compact, AI is the most important chapter, uh, at least um, at the moment. And there is a group of uh, intelligent people advising the Secretary General on this. And the idea that is, has been floated within this group is uh, an AI governance body or mechanisms or an institution or a procedure that will help us uh, identify and then also implement some some principles that might be applicable to everybody. So not only to, you know, the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere, but also the um, the Global South and China and other uh, Asian actors. So there will be some, it will be some very basic principles, but uh, we as Europeans are working very hard to um, familiarize our combatants with the idea of human centricity and risk-basedness so that could be two elements that could also be part of this global governance mechanism. So, but I mean, principles are one thing, and there are plenty, G7, voluntary commitments, whatever, which are important. I'm not saying it's not the case, but I mean, what, what about institutions and, and, and enforcing them? And I wonder, there's been talk about an IPP, IPCC for AI. Do, do you expect that uh, to happen? Or is that too early to talk about? Well, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the past three to five years, um, there has been a proliferation of four of to talk about AI governance. Every serious multilateral organization has come up with a set of proposals. I would think that, you know, for example, the ethical guidelines by UNESCO show very well where a global consensus could be. Um, with respect to, with regard to the body, <clears throat> I don't know where we come up with, but the climate um, the climate discussion, the climate de debate is perhaps a good showcase of, you know, um, 
recognizing which elements we need to really um, uh, get a handle on, on this mm. on this topic. And IPCC is uh, as a monitoring body and some uh, a, an institution which kind of um, uh, levels the information basis for all participants in the debate is perhaps a good start. So, Rish, what 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 kind of um, inst institutional setting uh, do you expect do you expect to to emerge at a global level? At a global level, and uh, I mean, do you think we actually need one? I mean, is, I mean, I, uh, I think an IPCC for AI is a terrible idea. Okay, why? I think that. Um, our best understanding, because because of the dual use nature of AI tech, right? The more concrete and the more specific we're able to get with with use cases, the more we are informed about what the right course of action is in any given setting. You know, the more broad we get, the harder it is to make meaningful interventions and to say anything beyond you know broad principles, right? When the G7 says something, it, it has to be at the level of broad principles because there's no way to go any deeper into it. So my instinct has always been, you know get to the specifics of the question, whichever specific sector you're talking about, and then you can make much more informed decisions about what's going to happen, especially because AI is dual use, and there are many potential benefits, and you have to be able to balance it out in any given sector in a particular way. Like there's some sectors, I think of medicine, for example, and the sciences, where there's a tremendous potential for benefit in the use of AI, as long as we can use it a little carefully. I think of other sectors, for example, in law enforcement, where there's an overwhelming amount of harm coming from AI and very little beneficial use case. But they're all, it varies a lot from place to place, and it changes over time. I think it's very hard to sort of do this at a global level beyond high-level coordination. And so I'm, I'm just not very convinced that the pace at which global governance works and the level of generality at which it operates and the variety of different circumstances among different countries is going to be something where you can say anything useful um, uh, globally. That's just, you know. So, I mean, does that mean that you think we do not need any global rules or any government's uh, uh uh, I don't. Regime. I, I defer to the to the experts who understand, you know, the nature of global governance. So I'm not going to come out and say I don't know. I just don't see it being very useful right now, given the kinds of specific guidance that I think we need. Yeah, I just want to clarify one point though about the executive order. It is true that they can be overturned by another administration, but they don't automatically sunset. Someone has to actually come in over uh, and rescind the executive order and. I mean, especially in the context of AI, the previous administration, the Trump administration, had an EO on AI, which was still active in the Biden administration and is sort of has been folded into the work here. So just, as, I mean, I, I, I would much rather prefer to have legislation and executive order, but they don't automatically sunset. It's it, someone has to actually explicitly pull it out. Yeah. Kirsten, what, what, what's your opinion? Do we need... Global governance. I, I, I just kept thinking about who's actually using this technology right now and for what, and who are they governed by. And at a really large scale, this technology is currently used by global companies. Um, all of the people that I work with are global companies. And the, the questions that they ask is, what is a minimum defendable framework, a minimal defendable uh, governance and guardrails and risk assessment framework and that's not going to be answered by principles and I think if the UN wants to play a role that kind of high level principles also by the G7 I agree with everything that was in the G7 document I don't think anyone I know disagrees but but then what, right? I mean, do I go to one of my clients that actually has, I mean one of my clients has more than 600 million um, customers. That's more than the whole of the EU. They are, they are in the global south and they themselves were like, we need to embrace the mess here, right? I mean, if we want to get ahead with the technology, being messy is much more productive than, than following, uh, than following some prints. I mean, yes, we agree with the principles, but then what, what tomorrow, right? What, how do these principles really translate into our everyday work with the technology without becoming either blah, blah, or completely unoperationalizable. And I mean, the, the harms of this technology currently right now is in, in very subtle use. It's not in, oh, all of the pictures only have men in them or something like that. That's not the case. It's in very, very subtle uh, uh, points. And those are not captured by the principles. I'm, I'm a believer in global governance for sure in general, but when I look at what the next few years, even five years will bring with this technology, I think what we need is a framework that helps 
the biggest users, and those are companies, um, essentially global companies, and they will actually also set the standards and come up with the um, standardization that helps them and not so much nation states because they are big users probably at some point also, but not as fast as the private sector, I think. Okay, thank you. Let's open this up to questions from the audience. Who wants to go first? Over there. Hi, my name is Topper Sherwood. I'm a um, German-American journalist and um, I was a publisher in the United States um, since 1990. Um, I guess I, I would like to hear the conversation go more toward uh, how uh, creators have been damaged by AI. Um, uh, writers, musicians, uh, publishers. Um, you know, I, I was selling books in 1998 uh, uh, from my publishing house and uh, to schools, textbooks, history books. And, you know, Microsoft in, in my state made millions of dollars selling computers to libraries. And, you know, every five years, they need new computers in the libraries. And all these computers, they're not buying books. And the same is happening in, in nonfiction and journalism. Um, I mean, these large systems basically operate on a, a what, advertising capitalist model that when I was working for newspapers, we supplied the content, somebody else paid for the content by selling advertising. And Google and Amazon and all the rest have just tore the, the rug and the, to pulled the money out of newspapers. And you see in the United States how many newspapers have gone down the hill and magazines. Um, so I'm less worried about the, the, you know, somebody making up fake news uh, because it's it's already replaced us, you know, content providers. Okay, since Microsoft was mentioned, I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want. You know, it's not just Microsoft. I mean, yeah. I, I I I'm trying to figure out the question. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah. So there there has been a lot of lot of different things. I think in that. Um, in that question, I think that some of the effects you described are not necessarily linked to AI, but more broader in like like to the disruption that technology has brought. By the way, possibly not just to publishing, but you have seen this with the music industry in the past that has has a tremendous transformation um, behind it. I would say the the points that you made, I think that these are all discussions point in the current debate when it comes to AI. I mean, obviously, there you have not just a safety and security debate, you have a debate around the copyright regimes, and you have a, uh, also a debate about what means privacy in that context. And we are actually in discussions with publishers um, on that topic here in Germany. Um, it, I would say it's early on, and what you see with the publishers um, is that they are at, at this point obviously also not sure what that brings because it has potentially benefits also for the publisher sector. And then they have, of course, concerns about uh, how it affects their business model, how it, how it applies to the, to the established copyright um, system and these things. And I would say, I think that Kirsten made the point early on that when you have this type of technology evolving, and I think the internet itself is, an, is another example of it, then existing regulatory regimes are somehow challenged because things do no longer fit completely. And that is something that is surely true for AI, um, as it was true for the internet. You know, like, I mean, and I'm very sure that we see these discussions not only in the two areas that I just mentioned, but other areas about how you have to modernize the frameworks. Um, the existing frameworks. I mean, the, the first part of the answer is there are frameworks actually covering it formally. And that's, that, that's particularly in the copyright space, it's actually true. But it doesn't prevent us from having a discussion on whether and how we need to modernize it. And, and that includes both. Like still kind of benefiting from the technology, but managing the impact that it, the a negative impact that it might have. And Thanks, Guido. Yeah. Anne -Marie. Hi, Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm a fellow here at the Academy uh, this fall. I want to follow up on the, the global 
uh, discussion because I served on the Secretary General's high-level panel for, on effective multilateralism, which was is supposed to be advising uh, the, the UN for the summit of the future. And it was 12 people, and it reflected the population of the world. There were four Asians, three Africans, two Europeans, two Americans, one North, one South, so I represented all of North America, and one person from the Middle East. And if you ask them the question about where should where and how should we regulate AI, they would say the common law approach, and Suresh, that's what you, you outlined, a common law approach. We go case by case, we figure it out. They said, yeah, sure, that will absolutely privilege the white world, the white affluent world. And these technologies do have enormous potential for good, but only if, we're, if we really are deciding on them globally. So I'd love to hear comments because this conversation from that perspective is exactly what so many countries are afraid of. I think, Suresh, that's, that's you. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, there was an event that I was at in, um, in New York um, this is actually Alondra Nelson had run this event, and it was a public event. And we, one of the people on the panel discussing this was the Nigerian Minister of Digital Culture, and he was talking about, you know, things that are happening in West Africa around AI and what they're trying to do there. And their concerns were, as you pointed out, very different from concerns coming up in, you know, in the U.S. or in the EU. In fact, much like in India, the concerns were like, we actually need to do more with AI to create a presence, a local, you know, essentially supply of, 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 uh, of companies, of industry around AI to serve local needs in West Africa and not be dependent on the companies coming from the U.S. too. So that concerns are totally different. I don't necessarily see, though, that a common law approach of the kind of doing case-by-case -case concerns around AI necessarily obviates that possibility or, or prevents that from happening. I don't see how it privileges the Western world in the sense that I'm, what I'm saying is basically perhaps similar to what you're saying, that we need that I, uh, we need to understand the local context, you know, and local context will look very different. I just talked to a reporter in India who was asking about, you know, in the Indian data protection law and what, in, the Indian context for AI and what needs to be done with it looks very different to what will happen in, in, the, in the US, will look very different to what happened to you. So I find it, I, I have a hard time seeing how a broad global framework will cover all the various different imperatives coming from these different countries. I, I'm not, you know, I would say I'm not very well versed in the global framework as, as many of you are. So I will, I, I'm eager to hear others suggest how this would work. But the variety and the difference and the nuance and the subtleties that Kirsten also mentioned make it hard for me to imagine what kind of global framework actually is informative beyond, well, platitudes around what we should be doing. Sure. So the point is not just a global framework, although you do have to have that. The common law only works within a constitution or, or something else, but also global institutions. That was the idea of an IPCC uh, for AI, something like the, the World Trade Organization. In other words, actually something that would bite in ways that would l help level the playing field. So it isn't just the principles. The idea is you would also have at least some glo global or regional institutions. I will just say that um, I've watched very carefully the safety summit in the UK and how it was actually essentially almost overruled by Western companies that basically brought their, their view in there. And when it was never meant to be, it was meant to be a global forum to talk about this. And my worry would be that the power structures around the technology are already such that even in the UN body, even in any kind of global body, I'm not sure we would actually get the open discussion that you're looking for. We probably need it around power structures, around jobs, around ethical issues, etc. But I'm not sure that putting it to one body will get to the to the result that we that we need because it is too easy to over to overrun by 
of course, lovely people, but very powerful people. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we've never even spoken about the, the tech, the infrastructure around uh, <laughs> GPUs, etc. cetera. Um, you know. <laughs> uh, so I'd be just worried, you know, if you, if you concentrate, then the power also concentrates. And looking at the UK, what has happened already, not so sure that it helps. First you back there and then in the front. Sorry. Good evening. My name is Nelly Stratiev. I'm the editor of the Journal of AI Law and Regulation and the European Data Protection Law Review. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to pitch a thought experiment to you. Um, I'm a lawyer by training, but I make it a point to speak to um, software engineers. And recently I had a very interesting conversation with one of them working on developing AI. Um, speaking to her, um, she was telling me about agile software product development. And which made me think, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. Why don't we do that in lawmaking? Because lawmaking, it's such a traditional discipline following the, the waterfall principle of we're going to collect all the information, we're going to work on a law for <laughs> two, three, four, five years, and we're going to get something on the market without testing it, hoping for the best. <laughs> and then we don't know how the market reacts. What do you think as experts? Is there a place for maybe agile lawmaking where we go through iterations of the law, getting feedback from the market, from the stakeholders, trying better next time, getting, getting law faster out there. Thank you. I think I'm going to ask Serge to answer that because you're, <laughs> because, uh, I mean, for the simple reason that, the, I mean, the White House is at least trying something similar, or is it not? Or has tried, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that in some countries people pass laws from time to time. This is not something I'm personally familiar with in the U.S., but, <laughs> no, but <laughs> uh, um, I, I, I should say that this is a question that has come up over and over again um, in our work. Like, how do you make policy that's agile in the sense exactly that you describe? Um, you know, I'm a computer scientist who talks to lawyers all the time, so just the reverse of it. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's tricky. I think, you know, I, I will say that in the states, in the US, there is a lot of interest and appetite in exactly what you're describing. There's a lot of effort from, from lawmakers in the states to say, let's put something out there this year. Let's see how it works. With the knowledge up front that we're going to have to adjust it next year based on what we see playing out. So let's not try to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's not try to do something too big. But let's try, let's try some transparency requirements. Let's try some reporting. Let's try some minimal or, or sectoral enforcement and see what happens. And they do that. So this is still a TBD, a stay, sort of stay tuned and see what happens. But there is a lot of interest in that. Congress things are a bit slower. It's, it's kind of harder. Yeah, I think there's a sense right now that, you know, we might have one shot at something involving technology. And so, you know, we need to pack whatever we can in right now because in a year, attention will move on and we won't be able to do anything. That's, it's very hard to align with, your, with the idea of agile development, which I think is an important thing. I think what, you know, with the, with the executive order and with the guidance, there is an attempt to say, let us put in some frameworks, let agencies adjust to do the rulemaking or let the agencies do the rulemaking and then sort of adjust that as time goes on. There are, this is a bit of a longer story. There are some, there are some un threats right now to the possibility of agency rulemaking versus in terms of various court cases bubbling up the Supreme Court that might make it harder. We'll have to see how that plays out. But there's some worry that the agency's ability to do rulemaking could get compromised in certain ways and have everything be linked, have to be linked back to what Congress says or doesn't say. So there's an understanding that this needs to happen. There is a desire to try and make it happen, but there are some structural obstacles in place right now that are making it a little difficult. That's all I can say. I would like to defend European lawmaking and legislation here because um, it might be slower than an agile, a more agile approach, but 
what is also important here is um, that it is like um, you know it it defines a level playing field for private sector also, and it it give, it's like a lighthouse, so they are they know where to to uh, orient themselves on. So it's not um, it's not only the you know the the law when ready that gives information to uh, producers or developers of software, but also the entire public debate that kind of you know um, sets the course towards which also companies are heading. So I think it, the the influence on uh, you know on business model models is there even if the lawmaking process is not the quickest. Thank you. There was another question here in the front. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, I hope I hope I can formulate this correctly. Um, I, we you never got to talk about open source models. In, it's true, right? And I would like to kind of maybe put them in the context of what you, we call them European values, right? Because um, they kind of lay bare the maybe the conflict that's inherent in this idea of European values, right? Because there's some loud voices. Now, of course, we don't have an idea of what's actually being negotiated in Brussels right now because of the great transparency of the trilogue process, right? So we don't really know. But there are definitely very strong voices that want to make it very difficult to use open source models in Europe in the name of protecting us from ourselves, right? And to me, that is a violation of European values. And having been involved in the open source movement now and having looked at LLMs, the kind of creativity and the kind of boost to the freedom of expression that that can mean, the fact that people so lightly assume that we can take these, in my mind, authoritarian kinds of measures even into consideration is absolutely appalling. And I find people not sufficiently upset about that. Because it's something gets lost in the process. And this is a general problem with AI. Because, of course, it is a very powerful technology, but we are going to be confronted with this problem where we're going to be put in front of choices. We're going to have to defend our freedom against totalitarian impulses to ban things because they're uncomfortable or problematic in some way. I would like to, to know what your people, you know, what your thoughts are on that. I, I, I think um, uh, Guido is 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 a good person to to answer this because uh, Microsoft has kind of two uh, souls uh, here. Kind of, it has GitHub, and I get lobbied by GitHub on on uh, to favor open source models. But of course, there there's Open AI, uh, Open AI, which is is proprietary. So, so what, what yeah. do you think? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, course, yeah, yeah, I mean, with the two thoughts you already mentioned, it, there's GitHub. Um, then, by the way, Azure, to large parts, is actually also using open source. That's typical for the cloud sector. And then we have the cooperation with um, Meta. Um, so, there are... Yeah, it's a it's a complex environment, and actually that is that is le uh, leading me to a discussion that we actually had at, at the margins of the of the workshop today. First of all, I think that your your general um, assessment of the AI Act um, I, that is actually not, as far as I understood you, not open source specific. But I the the way I understand you is that it goes too far. I think that when you look at the discussion on the AI Act specifically, as far as I have in mind, the discussion was actually. Do we need exceptions for open source models in the AI Act? Basically, regulatory exceptions. And I don't know the latest <laughs> letters, but I think it, that's, not, that's not part of the AI Act now. And I think there are several reasons why this happened. The first one, and the most important one, is the complexity of the AI, one, uh, AI Act, and then combined with the complexity of what is open source in the context of AI. And that is possibly the the most tricky thing because everyone has an understanding of what is open source software, but I think there's not really an aligned understanding of what open source means in the context um, of, of AI models. And 
that has, I think that that has influenced the discussion on the AI because there's already so much complexity and discussions about definition, which is, by the way, just, just one more remark on this. I think that is one of the problematic part of the Brussels ambition to, to regulate horizontally. You always end up with a very problematic um, situation on the definition part if you like to uh, regulate horizontally. That is what you're seeing now. And that has, be, that has spurred the debate in, in, into the open source realm. But please... Um, add on this. Sure. No. Okay. Not. We have time for one more question. We, uh, and, can we uh, also ask one question from our online audience? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Then we have two more questions. Well. <laughs> um, machine learning based AI is fueled by one data and two computing power, both of which are currently owned by U.S. American companies mainly, that have to focus on return of investment. Therefore, will any laws made outside the U.S. not be barking up the tree without much hope to help European competitors? I mean, I can start with an answer. I think, the first of all, I think that the regulations that we're currently discussing are not competition-focused regulations generally. It's about safety and security. Maybe you could say consumer protection, as you put it. So that's actually, when you look at the AI Act, the ambition is not to regulate the, the, the competitive part of the landscape. That's just understanding. I mean, governments could come up with this if they see a problem, but that's just not the focus of the legislative approach that, that we're currently discussing because the safety and security has been prioritized. In terms of whether the analysis is correct, um, there's definitely, I mean, computing is definitely a, a large part of, 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 of the development that we are now seeing. Um, at the same time, and that is interesting, when you look to Germany and look to France, I think it is a situation where you indeed have uh, have German players, of France, you have French players, and they, they are ambitious and they are confident. Um, so... I'm not 100% sure whether I would share the analysis in a sense that this is a set in stone scenario. I think it's very dynamic currently um, and it, it, is a, it is a competitive race. And uh, by the way, actually, the business model in the end is not fully clear. I mean, that is all, all under development. Um, so, yeah, but, but referring it back to the regulatory frameworks, I think it's just not the focus currently of the, of the frameworks that, that we are seeing emerge. Great. Maybe, maybe just one thing, briefly. So just to put it out there really briefly. I think it's a very valid question, but I also think, I mean, these things haven't fallen from the sky. I mean, it, in the, the flip side of innovation and enabling innovation is also investment in innovation. And the U.S. for many years, as has China, has invested in talent, computing power, infrastructure and research. And maybe also Europe needs to face a little bit that we haven't necessarily invested as much in chips research as we should have. Because otherwise, you know, some of the, the chips and the infrastructure of this new technology maybe would be European. And uh, OpenAI hasn't fallen from the sky either. It's really, really expensive to train this large language model. And there was investment and there was the, the necessary talent and they could attract it. And I think this is also something that Europe doesn't often like to hear that it's not about national, building national champions after the fact, but it's also about these long -term in, the long-term investment and enablement of innovation. And it's not always that friendly in Europe, as the latest numbers also show. Not just the latest, I mean, to just today even uh, a few numbers shown. And that's, that's something that we also, I think, need to consider in that, in that um, power struggle discussion, which is super valid otherwise, I think. One last question up front here. Thank you. Uh, to use a turn of phrase that I heard earlier today, I'm a townie based here in Berlin. Uh, I, go with Kirsten, I go with something that Kirsten ended up saying about follow through in the middle of all this presentation. And so it, there's been a year of layoffs in the tech space this year. There's been articles on that written on the CNN and also on the information about what all of that has been happening. That has also affected like responsible AI teams and ones that are actually working on this with like safety and, and ethics and all of that. Um, this has even been some that's relevant in the board fight that was happening with OpenAI with regards to what was the ideologies of the two different board members. So like, what's the role of academia and policymakers on making sure that when we are working on this somewhat un regulated space, there's 
with people who want to work on this, how do we make sure that they can still do the good work on this and are getting hired to solve these problems? Um, like GDPR created something of a labor market. I mean, I, mean, I suppose that uh, that would be something that would be there if there was something like an, a, a space for AI um, that is still fairly unregulated right now and perhaps it doesn't have a stable a labor market. Is there a role in stabilizing that and making it or requiring or incentivizing investment in that labor market? Sure. So one thing that, you know, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right in all the concerns around um, the layoffs and the shedding of these sort of trustworthy, responsible AI infrastructures of companies. One of the things that the executive order does, for example, is call for increased staffing at agencies, uh, call for investment. I mean, there's a lot of talk around how much investment that needs to continued investment in, in AI research at universities and, 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 and at, at agencies as well. The FTC set up a new office of technology and they're trying to hire technologists who would work in that space well. So there is currently in it a desire to grow government expertise in technology um, as one place where you know academics can actually come into government and sort of help with uh, help policymakers think about these issues. I I'm hoping, and I don't know. I think Kirsten may have will have more insights on this. That the that current tech downturn will sort of is part of a cycle. I, I don't know if the, these things tend to move in phases, and um, I suspect that AI is going to cause a lot of growth in certain sectors anyway. So I guess we'll have to see. But I think at least on the U.S. front, there's this appreciation of a need for growth in the non-corporate sort of side around responsible governance, and there's an attempt to grow that. So thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we're run out of time here. Um, I mean, and sorry to the to the pre people I've, I haven't called on. There were more questions. I've seen that. I hope you've learned something, and uh, I think we could probably continue. But uh, again, we're out of time. Thank you very much.